Uh, hello, good day to everyone. I am Chris Bulanios, and I would like to give you today the first part of our online discussion uh, series on reimagining the kingdom from a scripture standpoint. And on this part one, I would like to uh, give it a theme and uh, what is there in the screen? Uh, the millennial reign of Messiah is an earthly kingdom. Just to give us some kind of hope uh, that uh, the hope for a future resurrection on earth, perhaps, uh, may I refer everyone to the book of Hebrews chapter 6. Uh, on verse 7, it says there, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh up upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receives or receiveth blessing from God. The earth itself, uh, uh, there is no part of the Bible uh, that condemns the earth at all. Uh, so every part of it, once we examine it really, it, it treats the earth as a blessing from God because God has created the earth. So there's no condemnation uh, of it. So uh, it's quite different from from Gnostic teachings. By holding steadfast to the covenant of God, then God will fulfill His promise. And uh, along with this promise of multiplying Abraham's seed uh, was the, of course, uh, the flow of abundance of earthly blessings. So let's move further to Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 1 to 5. And I would like to uh, re-emphasize again the need to understand uh, the importance of the earth, the concept of earth. And seeing the multitudes, he, the Messiah, went up into the mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So when you say blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, that part when it says poor in spirit might mean that uh, be humble enough so that uh, you don't become too uh, uh, full of yourself to the extent that you not you will not be needing God anymore. So perhaps that's the best interpretation that I can grasp as of the moment. To be poor in spirit is also some kind of humility uh, that you can take upon yourself so that you, you can really uh, say that you are in need of God as opposed to, to, to uh, being too independent and rebellious it's uh, saying to yourself that you don't need God. Uh, and uh, because you truly seek for God, then you truly seek understanding of what His kingdom is like, the kingdom of heaven. But again, uh, there is a big connection between the kingdom of heaven and the earth here because by being meek, by being... Uh, uh, humble, you will also inherit the earth. So uh, the principle of heaven here has to do with earth itself. In fact, in other parts of the Bible, in Isaiah and also in the book of Revelation, as we shall see later, uh, you will find the, the notion or the concept of a new heaven and a new earth and they always come together. Okay, so th there's no part of earth here that, that the Bible suggests that will be gone or destroyed, if not renewed. When we speak of the end times and the nearing of the day when the Messiah comes, it is often misconstrued as the end of the world. Okay, so uh, when you say... The, the end of the world, then that's the end of the earth, the destruction of the entire creation or of the earth. 
Okay, so, but uh, what we are really saying when we say the end of the world or history coming to an end and uh, the coming of the day of the Messiah when he comes back, what we are really saying here is that he will come to put an end not of the earth, but he will put an end to the current world systems and administrations that have become so corrupt and that have caused so much suffering and slavery and injustice. This means that he will put an end to poverty and to famine and bad politics, totalitarian rule, depopulation, deception, war, social inequality, and so on. He will be coming back to rule as a righteous judge. This is the renewal of the earth rather than the destruction, rather than the end, which means to cease to exist. Uh, the destiny of the earth is not destruction, but renewal and rebuilding and making it even more abundant with life. Just as the word can make himself manifest in the flesh, can heaven also be made manifest on earth? So, uh, that's absolutely correct. The kingdom of Messiah is already a foretaste of eternity, isn't it? A heaven on earth. Because when the Messiah reigns, uh, a, rightful, uh, a righteous judge, then uh, he creates a peace on earth. And it's not some kind of artificial peace. It will be a real peace, uh, a, a wholeness of peace, uh, a peace of shalom if you want. Uh, because he will put an end to all those corrupt practices and corrupt governments uh, that we tend to experience uh, now in our lifetime. Uh, and he will bring joy rather than tears and he will uh, bring almost like a heaven on earth, an abundance. And we will even see later that he will... Uh, uh, give us uh, the opportunity to have a taste of the earth like never before, the abundance of the land, uh, plenty of food, uh, abundance of fish in the sea, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, that there will be complete peace. So, uh, a new heaven and a new earth appear also in Isaiah 66 and Revelation 21. The old earth is replaced not by a spiritual, non-corporeal reality. The, the earth is not to be replaced by uh, a non-physical reality, but rather by a new earth. It is already a preparation, a continuing renewal of the earth, but it will be a joyful renewal in the process of, of uh, waiting for eternity, that 1,000-year reign of Messiah on earth, shall be, uh, well, uh, almost like a heaven on earth because it will be uh, a, a joyful uh, renewal, if you want. The expression of the renewing of the earth can also be likened to the Hebrew concept of, isn't it, uh, the renewing of the cycles of seasons, the Moedim, the sabbatical cycles. And the cycles of the moon, for instance, which in Hebrew we call Rosh Kodesh. So, earth will be renewed just as the cycles, the cycle of the moon is renewed every time. In Isaiah 9, it states there, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. So when you say kingdom comparable to that of David, it's a, a renewal of the throne of David. It's just that somebody will sit on the throne which is greater than David to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Revelation 19 says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with 
a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. This is the part when he reveals himself on earth. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with, with it he should smite the nations. And we say the nations, of course, the nations on earth at that time. And he shall rule. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his tie a name written King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and referring to Messiah himself, who will be coming on earth. Uh, downward towards uh, uh, verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth. Again, uh, the emphasis of the kings of the earth. And their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And you are referring to the faithful and true one that is riding on the horse that we mentioned earlier. And these kings of the earth uh, will go and fight against the one uh, sitting on the horse and against his army. So wh where will this war take place? It's very clear here that it will be uh, a war on earth. So the beast and the kings of the earth will join forces to go to war against the one who sat on the horse. And this will take place definitely right here. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which with he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. There both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Uh, it is unclear in Revelation uh, exactly where this lake of fire will be exactly. But uh, the whole point of this verse really is that uh, Messiah will come and defeat the beast and the false prophet. And they will be thrown on the lake of fire. Revelation 20 is another revealing text. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of uh, Messiah and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. They lived and reigned with him a thousand years. So uh, when you say they live, uh, that is, they had resurrected bodies. And they lived and reigned with him for a thousand years. Because in the next verse, it says, The rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So the first resurrection happened uh, as the Messiah comes back to earth and defeats the peace and the false prophet and resurrected those who were faithful witnesses of him. Okay, so that's the first resurrection. So they lived again, but those, the, the rest of the dead did not live again until that thousand years were done. Okay, so it's very clear there that uh, there is a resurrection that will happen, and the resurrection, we suppose, will be likened to that of Christ himself when he resurrected from the dead. Uh, after he was crucified and was placed on the tomb for three days and three nights. So that kind of resurrection towards a glorious state, which is also a physical resurrection, will happen also to the saints. It's just that uh, Yeshua, the Messiah, whom they call Christ, uh, is the first fruit. Okay? So the one who resurrected, and he will be coming back to resurrect the rest. It's like uh, 
the grand harvest that will happen after offering your first fruit. So it's very important to, to know about the feast days. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. It says on uh, verse 5. So uh, that will uh, confirm that this is uh, a resurrection into a physical body, a resurrection perhaps into a glorious physical body. Because they will live again. So they live again and reign with Christ for a thousand years. It's very clear in uh, verses 4 and 5. Uh, blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection, referring to those witnesses. But of course, uh, the witnesses refer to those who have his testimony and obey his commandments. On such, the second death had no power, and they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him for a thousand years. That will be the end of uh, our reflection for today, uh, for the first part of uh, our activity. Thank you.